What's up, heathens? How ya doing? Today, we're going to be continuing our talk with Richard Carrier. Uh, we're going to explore the Bayesian calculator and the Crestus app. If you haven't gotten the Crestus app, please go down below to the links. Get it now. It's well worth the money spent on it if you're interested in this kind of conversation. Now, what we're going to go over today is another bit of evidence uh, called the Nazareth evidence. We're going to be going over that and what that evidence exactly is. It was actually proposed by Christopher Hitchens uh, back in the day. So we'll be going over that. We'll also be going over how historians have actually been using Bayesian analysis uh, for a long time and uh, without knowing it. So if you're interested in this stuff, then please stay tuned. Right. So uh, I'm going to add another. So on the bottom left of the evidence square, I've got this evidence square. It says Tacitus, worst odds one to one, best odds three to one. And there's a plus sign. I'm going to hit the plus. Now that adds evidence item two. And you see there's a number, a new box you can slide up. Number two, and it says evidence. And it's just like the other box. Now I'm going to call this one Nazareth. I'm going to go in there, hit the edit button, and change the name of the evidence to Nazareth. Now this is one an argument. Everybody loves to cite this one because Hitchens uh, used this argument. And the argument is uh, Nazareth was a ho-dunk town. Why would they say Jesus came from Nazareth when they already had a prophetic basis for him coming from Bethlehem? Why would they have to try to create these convoluted stories to make him come from both? Um, the argument being that it's unlikely they would have made that hard work for themselves to try and make him come from both towns unless he really did come from Nazareth and that contradicted the prophetic claim that he would come from Bethlehem, and so they had to try to integrate these. And so they're saying, well, that's unlikely unless it was real that he really did come from Nazareth. And so this is evidence for historicity. This is a, a kind of an argument from embarrassment, in a sense. It was embarrassing that he came from Nazareth, but everybody knew it, so they had to do something about it. Yeah, but... There's I mean, a lot that's, of problems with that argument. Well, but yeah, yeah. The, the criterion of embarrassment's got a lot of issues with it. I mean, we don't know. That's true, too, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't know what was embarrassing to Like, why would it be embarrassing to come from Nazareth? Right. There's a lot of things there, especially since, and this is when it gets uh, really problematic, um, when, you, when you start looking at what's in the background knowledge, right, because your probabilities have to be based, they're conditional on the background knowledge. What do we know? We know that the... Um, the prophecies also said the gospel and the Messiah would come out of Galilee. Well, Bethlehem's not in Galilee. So, how, so you've already got this prophetic problem. So, you have to, so the prophetic problem is how do you reconcile these two contradictory prophecies? You don't need a historical Jesus for that, to be the, that problem to exist and for there mm -hmm. to be a need to solve it, right? So they're like, so they're figuring, well, how can he come from Galilee and Bethlehem? Well, he must have come from some town in Galilee. So how did they pick a town to assign to, to make this prophecy work? And Matthew says that there was a prophecy that says the Messiah would be a Nazarene. And in fact, not even a Nazarene, it would be a Nazorian, which doesn't even mean someone from Nazareth. <laughs> so uh, Matthew goes and looks for a town basically that's closest in, in Galilee, that's closest to uh, Nazor's and uh, Nazareth. And it sounds similar enough. Okay. So we're going to make him come from Nazareth and that will explain why prophecy said he would be a, a Nazorian. And uh, now the, our current uh, texts of the Bible don't have that prophecy in it. But the thing is, is that text Texts of the Bible read differently back then. So they actually had contents that they don't have today. And they were using different books. The Old Testament canon had not been picked yet. So what the Christians were calling uh, scriptures was a, a, a more diverse body of documents than is in the Old Testament now. So it, clearly they, they thought prophetically that Jesus would come from somewhere in Galilee and that he would be a Nazorian and, and that he would come from Bethlehem. And so they're trying to solve this problem. Now, once you know all of that, you put all of that in and go, oh, well, okay, now that's equally likely that, that the Nazareth would be the town of sign because I, you've got just as likely that uh, he didn't exist and there was a prophetic reason to invent the Nazareth origin or he did exist and Nazareth is a genuine origin for where he was like both theories explain the evidence equally well and so you ha you end up with one-to-one -one odds like the, the evidence doesn't favor either one really right I'm, I'm recalling that there's because you know the Christians have this list of like 353 or some odd prophecies that Jesus supposedly fulfilled. Right, yeah. I think one of them was talking about a really vague passage talking about a branch or something. And right. they interpret that as being from Nazareth. Right. There are some in, in Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew, it's Netzer, and so you, you can you can kind of construct uh, a, a another prophetic basis for Nazareth. That's entirely possible. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, there, there have been a number of arguments. I discuss all of these actually in Proving History. I have a right. whole section on where it, all these alternative theories that are coming from other scholars, not mythicists. These are like historicists are saying that, that this prophecy is in there. There's information about that. And um, I, so there's a variety of different ways that that can come from prophecy. Right. And I, I highly suggest to everybody to get on the historicity of Jesus if you really like this kind of information. Because, I mean, I've got both the audiobook and the physical copy uh, that I use to, to reference and, and really kind of refresh my memory on. Because you did an awesome job of just basic, like, uh, first century Christianity kind of information. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, you know, you, you uh, of course you, you talk about, like, how it applies to the historicity of Jesus, but, I mean, it's just, uh, what, what I like about it is just bare facts. But uh, anyway, sorry. Yeah, F and thoroughly referenced, yeah. yeah. So it's not just thrown out there with, anyway, there's tons of footnotes, the bibliography, the primary evidence is cited, you've got all the data in there. Yeah, the book is super useful for that, uh, for building out, that gives you all the background knowledge you need, it gives you the evidence and the facts and things like that. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend Hitchens was right and that, that, that we don't have – that a Nazareth origin is unlikely on the Jesus myth theory. That's actually not the case as I explained, but right. um, it, it's just as likely either way. Uh, but let's just say we're going to do best odds on this. So I'm going to leave the worst odds at one-to-one -one that Nazareth is equally likely. Uh, and then I'm going to say on uh, best odds, three-to-one. that there's a three, It's three times more likely that Jesus would be assigned to Nazareth if he really came from there than if uh, it was some sort of prophetic origin or some other reason to assign him to Nazareth. Uh, and so, so now I've got two items of evidence, and you can look at them, you can change them, edit them. One, Tacitus, two, Nazareth, and you can keep going. Like, you can add item, item, after item, after item. But I'm going to stop there, and I am just going to, uh, now that I'm using this um, bogus Tim O'Neill, Christopher Hitchens argument, uh, <laughs> and click results. And then it will say, the probability Jesus existed is now between 50% and 90%. So it's done all the math for you. It's using your worst estimates and your best estimates and building a range, a final range. And what it comes up with is, in the worst case scenario, even on your own arguments, it's 50-50 whether he existed or not because uh, of how we assign the lower, the worst case scenarios. Uh, but on your best evidence, you, the evidence you think it, or the odds that you really think it is, that really like Tim O'Neill thinks it is, for example, well, the, the probability he existed is 90%. It goes up to 90, right? And you can keep back adding evidence that might go up higher and higher. So, uh, so you, you can use this to even model incorrect arguments. So you can say like, well, this is why Tim O'Neill thinks the probability is high because he's in his mind estimating these high odds in these other places. And so that's where you can go in there and, say, and do, do his assignments of odds actually make sense, even though he doesn't pick numbers for these. And he's intuitively saying things like, like it's more likely, he's using uh, the vocabulary of probability. Um, so you can show like this is, explains his argument. This is the structure of his argument, why it is that way. And then you would go back and critique the premises just like any other argument. Like this is the conclusion does follow from those premises. But the premises are what are these odds assignments? And so you could go back and you can criticize those things and say like why, why should you say it's more likely that Jesus would be assigned Nazareth if he really existed than if he not didn't? And that enters a whole other debate about that. And you can even break those down and make Bayesian calculations for the individual items like that. And so uh, anyway, that's the basic structure of it. If you, uh, I'm going to flip back out uh, to the main menu, but that's the, how the Bayesian calculator works. Uh, and if you want to reset and clear everything, just, just force close the app, uh, you know, the, uh, what do they call it? Reboot the app, yeah. and uh, and it'll clear the memory, and it'll it'll all be back to zero, and you can go back in and fiddle around with the Bayesian calculator again. Right. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the coolest, most useful features of this uh, app that I think. And, and it, plus, you have all the other data in here, those things you can learn, and, and the menu trees and things like that. Right. Well, I know um, one one of the cr uh, I guess criticisms of this particular method is that like. Um, with history, of course, <laughs> I, I watched Tim O'Neill this morning, as you can tell. <laughs> but um, with, with history, you don't have hard data to assert these probabilities, even though, like yeah. you said, he uses the language of probability. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering how how you would respond to that, like like just them saying, "Oh, well, we can't know the probability of this or what." Right, and that's of course uh, you you obviously can if you're saying that it's probable Jesus existed. Clearly, you're cl making a claim that something's probable. Right. How probable? What do you mean by that? Right. So, uh, and you can you can be honest and say, "Well, I mean, it's at least fifty one percent." Right? right. So it's like you know, and that's, so that means fifty one to one hundred percent. That's your range. That's your margin of error. So yeah, the, the uncertainty due to the the lack of hard data, they say, 
that uncertainty you can model just by putting in the numbers to the, to the worst case and best case scenario based on your own estimates. Uh, but you do have to mean something. This is the thing. Like if you say uh, it's just very unlikely that Jesus would be assigned to the town of Nazareth unless he really came from there. Well, that word, very unlikely, that phrase, has to mean something. Obviously, it has to mean something different from uh, slightly unlikely, right? Or, or, or equal odds, or it's just as likely. Like, these words have to mean something different. Mm -hmm. And so you have to actually sit down and be honest with yourself and say, what do I actually mean by very likely? Like, what, what does that right. mean in terms of actual uh, numerical values? And you, can, you think of it in terms of, like, what's the least probable it could be? And I would still call it very probable, right? Uh, and I talk about this uh, just recently, a blog art, I, article I put up uh, this week, uh, or uh, um, uh, the, uh, I don't remember what day it was, but uh, um, the uh, called uh, a, not being a doofus about Bayes' theorem, and like how not to be a doofus about Bayes' theorem. And I go in there and, and, and in the process of that explain that this is what we're always doing. Like we're always using probability language, but we need to be honest with ourselves and say, what do we mean by that language? And we do have to mean something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so it, it's a question of semantics. It's not a question of what is the hard data. We're not talking about the hard data. We're talking about what do you mean as a person when you're saying very probable. You've got to mean something. You probably don't mean 60% because you wouldn't call something that 60% is not great. It's better than not, but it's not great odds. You wouldn't call that very probable, usually. That's not normally what you mean by very probable. And if it is what you mean by very probable, you're using the word very in, in a strange way that's going to miscommunicate to people. They're going to hear something else. They're going to think you mean more like 90% or something, right? So like, people are already guessing what you mean by very probable. So you've got to like uh, be honest about what it is you mean. Uh, and then that's how you can construct whether your conclusion follows from your premises. And your premises are, are what you mean when you say things like, this is very probable or this is not very probable uh, or slightly probable or whatever it is you're saying about probability. So yeah, it's not about getting numbers from hard data. It's about trying to articulate what it is that you mean when you say these things. Right. Uh, and and do, does your conclusion even follow from what you're saying? And that that's just a matter of logic. That's not even a matter of like hard data or anything. Oh yeah. And I mean, like, you know, like we've been talking about, you can translate like what you mean into uh, uh, I guess approximations of, mm -hmm. of yeah. probabilities, and I think that that is a, a particular thing that they don't seem to grasp. It, right. Is, is yeah. that you don't have to be hyper specific about That's right. probabilities. That's right. So I don't know. Uh, I can't remember exactly when you posted this, but it was either last week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, you posted an article about how somebody kind of went through and applied your Bayesian reasoning. Um, and, and, and it really came out well for you as far as the review went. Yeah, um, Ephraim Wallach. Uh, so I, I um, wrote an article about this, summarizing what he published. It was a test of Bayesian history, Ephraim Wallach, on Old Testament studies. And uh, he published an article in Synthes, which is a journal of analysis, uh, a peer review journal. And um, what he did is he tried to apply this Bayesian method to modeling how historians, archaeologists, changed their mind about uh, the origins of Israel. It used to be like, oh, it's the biblical story. They came from Egypt and conquered uh, Palestine. And, uh, but now it's the view is like, well, actually, they were Canaanites all along, and basically they just outcompeted the other Canaanites uh, in the local area. And so they were always there and never came from anywhere else. Uh, and that indigenous uh, hypothesis is now the prevailing view. Uh, which which ties into the whole Exodus story is not historical, right? So that's mm -hmm. that's another thing has changed is uh, people have realized that, that Moses didn't exist, uh, the Exodus tale is fiction, and it was just invented later to justify current government institutions and current cultural things and and so on. Um, but that change took place over a course of about a hundred years. And what he does is he models it using Bayes' theorem, showing that all the arguments that led to the changes of view over time perfectly match Bayesian reasoning. And so they, even though they weren't aware that they were using Bayesian models to argue it, he can show that they were. And when he does this, uh, he uses um, what's called sensitivity tests, where he actually goes back and like changes some of his assumptions to see how sensitive his conclusions are to those prior assumptions and finds it's very robust. Like you can change the prior assumptions a lot and still get the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. And that's his way of showing that uh, it, it's, it, you can have a very blurry, uncertain model and it still matches reality. So it's the, right. that's the, uh, it's not a question of like being hyper precise about data or anything like that. You can be, you know, sort of ballparky uh, and allow a wide range of, of error in there. Like, like it could be as low as this, it could be as high as this. 
uh, and uh, and you still get a useful conclusion. Like, what should we conclude, even given the uncertainties in, in all of this? And so he shows how to do that, uh, and, and at the same time shows that it, it actually works in terms mm -hmm. of, like, this is actually what's going on. And when you realize that's what's going on, that really all that time they were arguing in a Bayesian fashion, this can actually help you to actually analyze and question their premises and arguments. So, like, historians could become better historians if they understood what was under the hood of basically the engine that's driving their car of reason, right? So they're, they're essentially driving this car that, that they think like leads from premise to conclusion, but they don't know any of the mechanics of why the conclusion follows from their premises. They just sort of feel it in their gut. It's like intuitive. But there is an engine in there that's actually doing it. There is a mechanism, and it is Bayesian. And so if you understand the mechanism, you can pop the hood and look in there and see where things are going wrong, if things are going wrong, mm -hmm. or see if things are going right. And, and confirm, like, yeah, actually, this act, the conclusion does validly follow from these premises. Uh, and so uh, that's why I think articles like that, we need more of them, because they're very useful in showing how you can do this and how it's a useful tool. Historians need to really learn it. Right. And, I, I mean, that's that, that's uh, kind of one of the things at the heart of, like, I guess the scientific method and just good, yeah. good methods in general is that you have multiple people come in, try to reproduce your stuff. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious, like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually a good, I mean, you're talking about like showing how Bayesian modeling works in history, but it, it also works, uh, at, at all levels in terms of, uh, you know, how do you re, how do you replicate a historian's intuition, right? Like, so right. you're like, you're going to go in and okay, does that, uh, does their, uh, conclusion follow from the premises if we replicate what they did? But since historians never, they, it's all hand waving in between premise and conclusion. There's no clear logical connection between them. It's all more like just assertion and intuition and feels. Uh, uh, so how do you replicate uh, what they're doing? Well, you have to model it with Bayes' theorem and see if it holds up. And so that's how you replicate. That's how you can actually replicate and confirm historical conclusion, conclusions are valid. Mm -hmm. So it, you need to know what's inside that engine. What's what, what's the mechanism that's connecting premise to conclusion in history? Uh, and when you go looking for it, trying to find it, you end up finding what Tom. Thomas Bayes did, which is it's this particular mathematical formula. This is what historians are always doing. Uh, now, we didn't realize that's what historians were doing until hundreds of years later, uh, but there have been several scholars who pointed this out under peer review, myself uh, and Aviezer Tucker um, and uh, now Ephraim Wallach and, and uh, others also in archaeology have written about this as well. Right. And I'm kind of curious, don't you find that it's kind of interesting how uh, – you, you know how we went from thinking that the uh, pen, penta something the first five books of the Old Testament right Pentateuch Pentateuch was uh, completely historical and then it changed <laughs> over time and now we have you know the 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 way that we see it now being that it's it's fictional yeah and, and it's not historical. Um, but then you know but then you get up to the Jesus debate. And all of a sudden, everything's historical again. Mm. And and <laughs> you know, they they tried to apply the same kind of methods to the Old Testament. And uh, you know, after those failed, you know, of course we have our, our view now. And so I'm kind of curious. I mean, why do you think that that they're holding on to these kind of failed methods? Because in, yeah. in your book and, and and everything, you go over how these methods don't actually support their claims. Yeah, and even even they admit that sometimes. Uh, that, that there's a lot of self criticism within the field. In fact, every every dedicated study of the methods in Jesus studies that have been published, every single one has concluded they did it, they don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I document this in my book, Proving History. So for those who don't think that's true, definitely go look at that. I cite and quote the scholars in these studies, and they, they're all saying that these methods are they're hinky. They're not really great methods. Uh, and, and if you go in there and try to fix them, what you end up with is a, some sort of Bayesian model. And uh, the conclusions then don't follow because you can't apply them to things like the, the things they want to apply them to because they just don't have the pieces of information they need to apply these methods correctly. So what they end up doing is they apply them incorrectly and claim to have succeeded in something. And the, the end result is like this huge diversity of contradictory views about the historical Jesus that no one can agree on because they're using these bogus methods that don't work. Uh, uh, and so it's part of that, but I, I think there's a number of different things going on uh, in the field. One is just inertia, like they just don't like the idea uh, of, of radically changing the way they look at things. They, they, this happened with Moses, too. Like in the 70s, when Thomas Thompson came out with his thesis saying, actually, Moses didn't exist, huge pushback. Like They tried to destroy his career. They tried to like, like really uh, resist everything about this and say, we can't do this. 
now decades later, now it's the mainstream consensus, mm -hmm. right? So it took decades for, for this to finally like, okay, right. Yeah, actually he was right all along and we probably shouldn't have been such dicks about it. <laughs> um, and I see the same thing happening with Jesus. It's that, it's that going on. But a lot of this has to do with the fact, and I think it's mainly this, is that it, it, Christianity is so tied to this. They, they've, they've basically gone all in on histor historical Jesus. They, even though there are models of Christianity that would work without a historical Jesus, um, they've bought into other models that they, they, so they can't go back now, right? So they're basically, Christianity is invested in a historical Jesus. And this creates a problem because in biblical studies, in Jesus studies, in early Christianity studies, the vast majority of scholars are devout Christians. And something like two out of three of them work at institutions that contractually obligate them to maintain biblical inerrancy or... Uh, uh, um, biblical literalism. So, uh, so they literally would lose their jobs. And in fact, we, there's examples, David Fitzgerald wrote a book, um, Jesus Mything in Action. And I think volume one of that has, a, he did a study mm -hmm. where he got a bunch of people to go out and, f and call these religious studies departments where all these scholars work and find out how many of them have these contracts that you have to sign that, that you lose your job if you even admit any of it is fiction. Uh, and so there, there is this, there's that intense pressure going on. There's the need to defend the faith going on. So like most of these people are devout Christians and so they can't tolerate the concept that Jesus didn't exist so they have this desperate need to do that but even the secular scholars their departments their positions their jobs their access to conferences their uh, their paper peer review uh, access to grant money all of this is controlled all of this is controlled by Christians so they don't want to offend Christians too much like there's only so much shit that they can throw at Christianity and still get away with it and to do this would be like a last straw. So they, there's a, so that's why there's a lot of pushback there as well. I think the secularists don't want to deal with this either. They would rather just say, well, let's just say Jesus existed and shut up, like, you know, like that kind of thing. You know, you're ruining it for all of us. Uh, and then others, of course, become so invested in their own theory of Jesus, uh, the historical Jesus, that they can't let that go. And so they, they, they see any you know, claim that Jesus didn't exist as a threat to their own theory. And so they have to defend it at all costs. And I think that, and that combined with the fact that history departments, a lot of these people have never been through a history degree. They actually only have theology degrees or divinity degrees uh, or, or Bible degrees. And uh, even the ones who've been through history, uh, a history graduate program, history graduate programs are really terrible at teaching methodology. Like you're, you're just supposed to figure it out. Uh, there's no like coursework in methodology. There's no coursework in logic of history. And so a lot of these historians are just working with their gut. Like they don't even know how their own methods work or, or why their methods work. They just intuitively are sure that they must. And then they just pick up methods that they think are sure it will work and they use them. So there's a lot of methodological uh, screwiness in history that is fine uh, when you're dealing with things that are highly certain, when the bodies of evidence are vast, like the Holocaust, for example. The, the evidence for that is vast. If we had that kind of evidence for Jesus, like, this would be a settled question. And it's the same for like Augustus, Julius Caesar, Spartacus, Hannibal, like whoever you're going to pick, Socrates even, that we have better evidence, much better evidence for their existence than for Jesus. And it's so good that it's uh, immune to a lot of methodological hinkiness, right? So like you can, you can reach invalid conclusions and they end up still being true because the evidence was so good, right? Right? Uh, so, but with Jesus, the evidence is so poor and so complicated, uh, so compromised, right? It's so uh, problematic and scarce that it's hypersensitive to error. Uh, so like if you're using an invalid method, you can very easily reach an invalid conclusion um, because the evidence just isn't good. It's really foggy. Uh, and so that makes the Jesus question highly vulnerable to this stuff. Now, if, imagine if this were a debate about Hercules existing. Like there was that debate existed in antiquity too. Is, was mm -hmm. Hercules a fictional person or was he an actual historical person that they put in history? And uh, if we were debating that today, there's no institutional investment in Hercules worship, right? There's no, the money isn't coming from Hercule, Herculeanists, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, I think there would be a willingness to just say, well, okay, yeah, it's possible Hercules didn't exist. I think he did because of these reasons, but I'm not really adamant about that because there wouldn't be this investment in needing to defend it. Right. Uh, and, and they would be willing to admit like, yeah, okay, the evidence for the historical existence of Hercules is really scarce and problematic. And so like, yeah, like you've got a viable model for how Hercules could be invented, and that's entirely possible. We just don't know. Like you could have much more reasonable responses to challenges of the historicity of Hercules, for instance. Same with Homer. Uh, we have a whole debate in the field as to whether Homer existed. The consensus mostly is probably he didn't, that it's a name that was assigned to these texts after the fact. Um, and, and there's some good evidence for that. It's very similar to the evidence against Moses. Um, and so, uh, so and, and the other thing I think um, 
And I think, no, I think that's really the main thing. Is like if, if it wasn't a religion that society was so dependent on, financially, academically, culturally, socially, um, that this wouldn't be a, a hot button issue really. Like there would be right. people would be much more open to non-existence of Jesus, and even the experts would be.